Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you would like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback portion of your screen where you will see the chapter titles and direct links to each of those sections of the video, or you can use the timestamped links down in the video description. In this week's podcast, I have a bunch of tidbits. I want to ask you viewers some questions of, regarding your feelings about swatching. I want to talk about a yarn exploration journey that I'm going on and also update you on a project that I started earlier this summer. So let's get started. I'm always interested in the ways that people express themselves creatively. Even if that's not a creative expression that I would enjoy myself, I really like to see what other people do. And similarly, it's really interesting to me to see the types of things that people collect that are related to their hobbies. So last weekend, I came across an article about a woman who, she's a knitter and a crocheter. I don't know if she weaves too. She's got a number of different textile related hobbies, so I could identify with that. So in addition to knitting and crocheting and, and doing embroidery and other sorts of textile related things, she goes to estate sales where she will buy unfinished projects. So these are projects that other textile hobbyists have been working on and then they died and and these projects were left unfinished. And she has this urge to finish these projects. And one of the projects that she came across was this quilt that this woman had been working on. And it had two parts. It was a, a state quilt. So it was a, a quilt that had a different uh, piece, a different block of the quilt that was embroidered for each state. It had like the shape of the state and and the, the year it was established as part of the, the United States and things like that. So she had finished that part of it, but then she was doing another part of it where it was showing each of the, like the state flowers or maybe the state birds, something like that. But it, again, it was related to each of the 50 states and that was unfinished. And it was such a huge project. She didn't know how she could do, how she could finish it herself. And so she started asking people online if they would be willing to help her. And so she's sending off these little uh, quilt blocks to people to have them uh, finish it in, with, the, with embroidery. At some point last weekend, I was <laughs> searching the internet something to do with knitting. I don't know what, what led me down this path, but I came to this website where somebody has this collection of knitting needles, like vintage knitting needles, and they're all cataloged and everything. And she's, you know, got photographs of them and, and talks about the different types of them. And uh, it's really interesting. And I started looking at this website a little more closely and I realized that I'd seen the website before, but I had been looking at a different page. And I know that I gave you guys a link to this website once before, um, to the page where she has a collection of needle gauges. So, so on this particular page, it is a page about all of these sort of knitting notions and knitting needles and things like that. So as I was reading through this um, website, she mentioned a book that sounded really interesting to me. So I ordered it and it has come, I have not had much of a chance to look at it. So this book is called Needlework Tools and Accessories, A Dutch Tradition, and it's by Kay Sullivan. So I've seen reference to this book in a couple of places, and this is apparently a stellar piece of work. And it's really like a coffee table book. There's, there's uh, tons of color photographs in here of all different kinds of tools of, of all different sorts. And so I, again, I haven't had a chance to look through it because it just came, um, but it looks really interesting. So I will leave a link down below. Um, uh, it would be a link to Amazon about this book, but you can get information about the title and, and maybe your, your library would have it um, or could get it on interlibrary loan if it's not something that you would want to purchase yourself. And as I go through it, if I find interesting things, I'll talk about that in future uh, weeks, but I just thought I'd let you guys know about this. So on this website that 
that shows all sorts of vintage and antique knitting needles and tools and needle gauges and all that. She mentions uh, some, of, some of the famous historical pieces of knitting. And one of them in particular, this 13th century pillows that were found in a Spanish tomb. So they date these pillows back to 1267. And they're really uh, amazing um, examples of color work knitting. So even though this is one of the earliest examples that we have of like complete knitting, it's clear, it's clear that the knitters were not novice knitters. And we know that knitting was invented uh, several centuries at least before this. It's just that there aren't very many existing um, examples because textiles deteriorate. They would get used or they would deteriorate because of the weather. And so we don't have very many, but the, the conditions that these pillows were in were perfect in terms of humidity and all of that. So I will leave a link down below to, so you can read about them. The page at the website is in Icelandic, but if you're using Google Chrome, I don't know about other browsers, but in Google Chrome, when you go to a website that is in a language that's not your own, there'll be a little pop up at the top of the screen that asks if you want to translate it. And so if you click on English or whatever your language is, um, it will translate it. It does a pretty good job in English, although for reasons that I cannot understand, I spent some time trying to figure out on Google Translate why this word got translated this way or why this word was used this way. So these are pillows or cushions in a tomb. And the title of the page is called in English, Spanish anesthetist. And then the pillows themselves are called anesthetics. And in other parts of the page, they're called sleepers. So obviously there's something to do with sleeping and anesthesia and anesthetists that, that somehow the translation got a little wonky. But if you see those words on there, they're just talking about the pillows or the cushions when they're talking about sleepers or anesthetics or uh, anesthetists. Um, but it is a, it's, it's a fascinating, um, page and you can see the pictures of those pillows on there. And again, I'll leave links down in the description. So tidbit number four is a, an article that somebody forwarded a link to me. I had asked a question uh, of our local spinning group. We have like an online email forum and I'm a real novice spinner. I have a lot of knowledge about knitting and I have some knowledge about yarn construction and spinning, but not, not tons. But I, I like to look at, at yarn construction in terms of how, what are the advantages of this kind of yarn construction? What would be the disadvantages? And what is just, you know, random? And so one of those questions that I have is why so many commercial yarns have what is called a Z or an S ply so that the yarns are twisted in a certain direction and they're twisted so that if you looked at the, the twist angle, it would look like this, which is the, the, the center portion of the letter S. And there are some yarns that have a Z ply so that when the two strands are or three or four strands are twisted together, they have an angle like this, which is like the center part of the letter Z. Uh, Single yarns that don't have, you know, that aren't plied together tend to have the Z twist because two Z twist yarns are plied together in the S direction. So it's very common for a plied yarn to have this S, a final S twist. And I'm curious about how much of that is considered an advantage structurally versus just sort of a natural standardization. Well, everybody else does it this way, we, we might as well too. And the reason I'm wondering is because as I have been searching for yarns that have Z-ply in them, there aren't that many of them, that a couple of the ones that I found are woolen spun Z-plied yarn, and they're from mills that have a really sort of antique piece of equipment called a spinning mule. The spinning mule was one of the early technologies in machine spinning that launched the Industrial Revolution. So there aren't that many of them left. They, they have moved on to other sorts of 
of spinning machines. And so these older ones that create woolen spun yarn and using a spinning mule are few and far between. But two out of the three that I found of mills that have these spinning mules, their yarn is Z-plied. And I've been sending emails and trying to find out if that is just how their machine happened to be set up 150 years ago. And so that's so that's the way they do it. Or if there were if it was set up that way 100 and some years ago, because there was a perceived advantage to having a woolen spun yarn have Z ply. I mean, the the speculation that I have, and if any of you spinners have any idea, I would welcome some feedback. So I'm wondering if most knitters who knit what we call in the Western style, so they're always, the yarn is always going around their working needle in a counterclockwise fashion and all their new stitches are mounted exactly the same way, whether they knit or whether they purl, um, so that as they're knitting off of the left needle, the leg of the stitch that's closest to the tip is over the front. Those are all sort of markers of Western knitting. Um, if they are knitting with a Z plied yarn, that yarn is going to lose a little bit of twist as they go. So what I'm wondering is if there is an advantage, is the advantage that you lose twist and therefore the woolen yarn will bloom more when it's washed because that's one of the qualities of a woolen yarn is that it traps more air and it will bloom and it's lightweight and it's airy, but it's very warm. And I'm just wondering if that would be a perceived advantage. So somebody else, somebody pointed me to an article in the latest Ply magazine where a spinner actually did this experiment and she tried uh, single yarns with an S twist and singles with a Z twist and knit them to see what would happen. And then she had that and then she did the same experiment where they were plied um, S ply versus Z ply and then knit her swatches to see what would happen. And so she noticed a particular effect in that the fabric looked different or whatever, but she didn't mention, uh, she, what she was looking at is, is that you get a different effect. You, the, you know, the fabric will look a little bit different and so you can choose whether you're gonna spin this way or that way based on what effect you want. And every spinner is gonna be different and every knitter is going to be different. So the fabric they get may be somewhat unique. So I'm just wondering if there is, was a perceived or is a perceived general advantage to a Z-plied woolen spun yarn and what, what that perceived advantage might be. Um, so in addition to the Ply Magazine article, somebody in the spinning group posted a link to an academic article where there is this archeological um, studies of these different um, tribal settlements in the southeastern United States, like Georgia, Florida area, and then also some in South America. And so they've you know, been studying these tribes and, and what their culture was like and, and trying to figure out how much they may have intermixed and, and not. And part of what they were looking at was the cordage that they created. They could see the imprints in the ceramics. So there were ceramics survived, but the cordage itself didn't, but the imprint of the cordage survived. And so it, they were really kind of struck by how there would be some settlements where like almost all of the cordage had a Z ply and another settlement where almost all the cordage would have an S ply. It was like, clearly this, that you couldn't attribute this to left hand or right handedness. Like this was something that particular culture did. And you know, and why? And then they would find another site where it would be kind of 50-50. And so they had a lot of explanations and theories about oh, what could explain this, but it's just an interesting look in the, in the distant past, because this was not yarn that was being used for knitting. This is, this is cordage that was being used for other purposes, but that there was clearly some people did it one way and some, versus, some did it another way. And then they did an experiment at a university with some like high school students, like a summer program, and they had three different groups of them. And they were teaching them these uh, methods of creating cordage. And, and they had these different controls for how these students were going to learn these things. And really ultimately what they, what they got out of it was the way that the students would twist the singles and ply them was based on who taught them because these students, after they learned how to teach somebody else. 
So the students kind of learned in different ways depending on how they were taught, but then when they in turn taught another student, that new student was taught based on what that first student had taught. So it's clear that your, that your spinning teacher has an influence on you, but it would be interesting to know if anybody has any idea about advantages of a particular direction of applying. And if you know, please let me know down in the comments. Appreciate it. So this last tidbit is in response to a question I got in the comments last week. Somebody noticed, uh, has noticed this red tube that sits on the shelf here. It used to sit, I, I guess it used to sit up there. I don't even remember. And they wondered what this was. And so I said that I would explain what it is and what it's used for and try to demonstrate it if I could. So this is a tube, this tube is called a telitoscope and I will put the spelling on the screen. It's, it's a type of kaleidoscope. The way it's constructed is there is a tube and then inside the tube there are is a triangle of mirrors and in this this is a cardboard tube and so those mirrors are just pieces of metal that form this triangular shape all the way down and then at the bottom there's this acrylic ball and so this doesn't have moving parts in it the way a kaleidoscope does and and the the way that this can be used by a knitter is if you are thinking of using a bunch of different colors together in a project and you want to see how two colors are going to interact with each other, you can look through the two balls of yarn next to each other through this and just kind of rotate it and it will kind of spin those colors around. And I'm going to put a little bit of video that I had to take with my iPhone. It's not great, but it will give you an idea of of how this works. So that is a tool that you can use to see if colors work together. And I would say it's probably best if you are, are trying to see if two colors that you want to use together in a row are going to work together or not. Like if, if the colors are pleasing together. But that's not really where the color decision ends because you also have to keep in mind color value. So sometimes you can see two colors that you just love together side by side, but when you actually start knitting them, like you're alternating the two colors, they have the same color value and it's you can't um, really even see the design. I'm going to show you another tool that I use when I'm trying to choose, especially if I'm trying to just choose like three colors together that I think, you know, any pair of them might be used um, in, a, in a given row. So I want something that has, um, that's a light, something that's medium, something that's dark, so that regardless of which two are being used, um, that there will be enough contrast for the pattern to show up. And what I do for that is I use my phone and I take a monochrome photograph. And that shows you, you know, if the two colors look the same in black and white, there, you're not going to be able to distinguish the, the pattern very well in a particular row. So I knit this hat. This is a Shetland wool hat that I knit. It was The pattern was from the 2019 Shetland Wool Week. And there were seven colors in this hat. Now, I'm slightly colorblind. I would never be able to choose seven colors that went together. So I got a kit that one of the the, wool, the yarn company is put together. And so they chose the colors, but there was one section in here where I was having a terrible time telling the two colors apart as I was knitting. Uh, it was really, I was really, really struggling with it. And I, and it was because they had the same color value. And I'm like, why would they do that? Why would they put those two colors together? You don't, you, you want them to have a contrast. Well, the reason was, is because it was being, the, these are boats and these are sheep. So the, the, this is called the roadside beanie. So this is the idea is that if you were in the Shetland Islands and you were at the side of the road, this is what you would see. You'd see water and boats and you'd see sheep. 
And so there's this transition between the land and the water, and they're kind of like these waves. And so it was intentional that those two colors, this kind of blue and a blue green, were alternating because they were meant to blend. They weren't meant to contrast with each other, um, as you might want with like a geometric design of some sort. So that's a that's an interesting way. And it's these are two different tools that you can use to help you when you are picking color. Oh, I'll also leave a link down in the description. There's a, a YouTube video, it's like 10 years old. It's from a company that deals in telescopes, and they deal in these like inexpensive ones, but also really nice beautiful ones that are like pieces of art as well. But she really explains also more about kaleidoscopes. She's an expert. That's her company is about kaleidoscopes. So I will leave that link down in the description. Last week's Casual Friday was a lot about swatching. I was sharing with you these swatches I had done um, for the pockets that I am planning for the sweater that I'm reverse engineering. And I showed you the first example of it and just to sort of, it was like a proof of idea, like a proof of concept, like, is this going to work? And then the second one was, oh, okay, here are the problem areas and here's my plan for fixing them. And it, will I get the result I want if I fix them in this way? And so then I had the second um, pocket swatch. I, I spend a lot of my time every day swatching, not necessarily something as elaborate as that pocket swatch, but just experimenting and trying to figure things out or, or learning things. That is just part of my personality that I'm an information seeker and what I value is, is information and, and learning new things. And, and that's why I love knitting so much is because there really is an endless amount to learn if you want to. But that's also the beauty of knitting is that you can know the most basic rudiments of knitting, casting on, knit stitch, purl stitch, and maybe not even the purl stitch, binding off. You can learn one increase, one decrease, and you can just go to town. You can create all kinds of beautiful things with only knowing that much. But if you want to learn more, you can, and it's just endless. So for me, it was getting past this, you know, I learned a whole bunch my first year as a knitter, I tried all different kinds of stitch patterns and it was really exciting. And then I'd kind of reached the point where I wasn't really learning anymore. I still enjoyed knitting, but I wasn't driven um, to knit um, constantly like I was that first year or two. And it wasn't until I sort of learned how to learn more about knitting that I became like, a constant knitter. And part of that experience was realizing the value of swatching and what I could learn from them. But again, that is something that I value is learning and it's not necessarily what somebody else wants to do. They just want the instructions to get the thing. <laughs> and it's the thing that they want. And they enjoy knitting, but really it's the product at the end that, that they're most interested in. Every knitter is somewhere on that spectrum of process knitter to product knitter. And there are all different kinds of product knitters and process knitters in, in between. So for me, when I'm knitting a gift, it's I have something very specific. I've discussed it with the recipient. We know colors, you know, we've, we've discussed this all. And the goal is for me to make this thing for them and give it to them. I, that's part of the, the whole knitting for somebody is is creating this product and then it's a tangible symbol of my love for them like here here's me here's here's me for you you can think of me i thought of you while i was knitting it and you can think of me while, while you're wearing it it's that kind of a relationship exchange and that's very much i'm product focused because it's more it, it's about the relationship with that person more than it is about the process of me knitting but anything that isn't a gift is for me, I guess. But a lot of times like that hat I showed you earlier, I wanted to knit it, but I haven't woven in the ends, I haven't worn it. I'm, I don't wanna give it away, I wanna keep it. And in part, one of the reasons I wanna keep it is so that I can reflect back on it. And the next time I wanna do something in color work, if I have a question about something, I wonder if, some, if this would work, I can use that as a reference. So I learned something from the process. I wanted to experience Shetland wool. I wanted to try one of these uh, beanie hats and you know I you know there's just things I wanted to experience from the process of knitting that um, but I don't want to 
give it away either and I don't necessarily want to wear it. So I'm always looking for ways of learning more about knitting but not everybody is. And so I'm just curious about resistance that people have to swatching. If it has to do, if it's like the resistance that I had in the first, you know, 20 years I was a knitter where I didn't really see the value of it because I didn't know what I could learn from it. I would check my gauge as I was knitting and everything was fine, but I was using the, uh, the yarn called for in the pattern. I wasn't really deviating away from that. I wasn't trying to make modifications because I didn't know how. And so, to me, the swatch, knitting a swatch wouldn't have told me any more than knitting the project and then and using the project itself as, as the gauge swatch. And yep, yep, I'm getting the right gauge. So it was when I learned that I could actually compare techniques, try out techniques, see what would happen if I did this, or if I wanted to design something myself, I wanted to experiment with stitch patterns, like how do they look next to each other? That was when I really got sold on swatching and because, it, because I realized how much I could learn from it. But again, not every knitter is the same and not everybody cares. They want to, how do I do this? I don't care why it works. <laughs> I don't, you know, they don't, they don't care. So I'm curious for those of you who are resistant to swatching, is it just because you haven't come across the need to learn something from a swatch or do you just not care about learning stuff from swatch? You just want to knit and have fun and relax and not have to think too much about your knitting. It, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious because it helps me understand as a teacher more where students are coming from if I understand why they might be resistant to something or why they might be drawn to something else or what I could expose uh, to them about the topic that they may not have realized and then open up their eyes to that. So if you have any ideas about your own resistance to swatching, I'd appreciate it if you leave some comments below. So I have talked before about how I am not a yarn collector. Like I don't have a huge stash. I have a significant stash of yarn because I've been knitting for so long and I knit all the time, but I'm not the kind of knitter who like, oh, I can't wait to go to this festival and buy a bunch of yarn from this vendor and that vendor. It's like, that's not something I enjoy doing. I, I will go and I usually will buy something, but I really don't like to accumulate uh, yarn if I don't have a project in mind. It's just not how my knitting brain works. I think about what do I want to knit? What sort of attributes is that thing going to have like stitch patterns and stuff? And then what color do I want it to be? And then I go find a yarn, a basic yarn in that color because what I'm interested in doing is creating interesting stitch patterns and I need the yarn not to interfere with that. So not all knitters are like that. A lot of knitters really love simple things to knit and they like to let the yarn do the work and they want something very you know garter stitch or or, or something that the end something they don't have to worry about it fitting and that is completely fine I, there's all kinds of knitters and they all have different focuses um, but i i'm just not a collector personality however i am an information seeker i love to learn and when i'm interested in something i want to know all about it so earlier this year, I started collecting these vintage knitting manuals and I was buying a whole, a whole bunch of them. And I, it got to be the point where I started like getting a little alarmed about how many books I was buying. And then I realized, oh, no, no, you're an information seeker. This is information like that, like books, like what's in the books is really important to me to have those and collect books. I'm particular about the types of books I get. I want reference information and for these vintage books, huge amount of information about how knitting patterns were written and what the fashions were like and the kind of yarns that were used and construction techniques that were different than today and and tips for modifications that, that you don't tend to see in today's books. So there's a huge, huge value in these books for me, um, maybe not for every knitter, but certainly for me. So I felt a little bit better about that once I realized, oh, don't forget you're an information seeker and that's what you're collecting is information. So lately I've been buying yarn and buying yarn that I have no intention of turning into a project. 
because I am doing this series of videos on, on yarn and in part because I'm interested in, in it. And the past, so the past couple of years, I, I started paying more attention to how yarn is constructed and how those different kinds of yarns, what, how, what sort of use they have. So I learned to spin a couple of years ago because for the because I, I was interested in learning more about different wool breeds. And when I went to like a wool festival, there was either like a clear plastic bag of raw fleece where you could sort of see see it through the bag, or there was fleece that had been scoured and and carded and combed and turned into a top that was maybe dyed and ready to spin. And they all, it all looked the same. It didn't matter what sort of wool breed it came from. So I didn't realize until I'd seen some cleaned, what they call long locks. They were like 10 to 12 inches long uh, in, a, in a booth. They have these one ounce uh, pieces or locks of different breeds. And so I could see the Icelandic wool. Oh, I can see the two types of coats that the Icelandic sheep has. I can see that. I'd heard about it, but you don't see that when you buy a ball of lopi yarn. You don't see that. And then, you know, I saw these other wools uh, that, you know, were maybe were shorter, but they had a lot of crimp. They looked like they'd been curled with a crimping iron. And then other ones that had like ringlets. And that was when I realized, oh, in order for me to, to make that connection between different wool breeds and their properties, when I knit with them, I need to learn to spin. I'd been avoiding learning to spin for years and just like really worked hard at not learning anything so I wouldn't get obsessed with it. But I realized, oh, okay, I need to learn to spin. And so I decided to learn to spin because of wool. And... So I learned quite a bit. I did not get obsessive with it, but I learned quite a bit about how wool goes from raw fleece into yarn. And that has led me into looking more into commercial yarns and how those uh, are constructed and, and how, how everything is processed and, and what sorts of projects uh, or stitch patterns this yarn construction might have versus this one. So I've been ordering wools from these smaller mills and some, some are from overseas even because I want to be able to, to compare all of these things. So there'll be more of these videos in the future, the technique videos um, on different types of yarn. But I, I, would, I kept, you know, every time I get one of these packages of yarn, I'm feeling excited about it, but then I feel a little sick about, oh my gosh, I'm collecting all this yarn that I'm not going to be using for projects. And I realized, uh, no, again, information seeker, you are collecting a yarn reference library. <laughs> and so that's how I'm thinking of it. And that also gives me an idea of where to store that in my office and how to think of it and uh, the kinds of swatches that I'm going to knit in order to uh, show off the qualities of particular yarns as well as show what they're not good for too. So it's, it's been kind of an interesting time in the past month or two of, of spending a lot of time knitting with these yarns that I don't have a lot of experience with. But in some cases, I realize as I'm knitting with them, geez, this is a lot like that rustic yarn is how is the language I had for it. This is a lot like that rustic yarn I used to knit our dog a sweater a few years ago. So I go look at my Ravelry projects. What was that yarn? I look it up and then I... Then I go look up on yarnsub.com and see what all the qualities of them like. Oh, it was a woolen spun yarn. I didn't, I didn't know the difference between woolen and worsted at that time. Wouldn't have known it to, to look at it. But now, now I understand what it is and I can recognize it more easily when I see it. So that's been happening a couple of times where I think, oh, well, that's an unusual yarn. I'm going to try that out and then realize I actually have some yarn like that in my stash and I'm work using a project with it. And I had noticed that the yarn felt different than I was used to. And I, and I didn't understand what it was about the yarn that was causing me to feel this difference. So I'm just understanding it um, more and more and feeling compelled to really um, do a deeper dive into this. So I'd be interested to know 
uh, you guys, if there are certain types of yarns that you're curious about and you wonder about, and maybe you have, a, have a knit with it and you thought, well, that didn't work out very well. That didn't work out the way I expected it to. Or, boy, this yarn was really terrific for this project. I wonder why. What, what was it about that particular yarn um, that worked out so well? So if you have any questions about uh, yarn, yarn types and constructions and fibers and all that and how uh, they work best for your projects. Um, why don't you leave those down in the comments because that will help me as I make these videos going forward. So I've been showing you in the past few weeks this sweater that I am reverse engineering and I'm planning on doing. I don't want to start another sweater until I've finished at least one of the sweaters that I have in progress. So I have two sweaters in progress at the moment. Um, one of them, a couple of you have been asking about in the comments in the past uh, month or so, and it's this 1890s uh, sweater for a boy that I started knitting in, I think, early to mid-August. So uh, I had left it, I had knit the body and I had knit the neck and I had had to, you know, rip back this shoulder part a couple of times until until I got it right because the instructions as written were not going to produce something that that worked, which is really the reason I knit this sweater is I couldn't figure out how that was going to work out <laughs> based on the instructions, and I was right. Every sweater, you know, is pretty basic up. From, from the wrist to the underarms on the sleeves and from the hem to the underarms on the body. Couple of, couple of tubes. It's when they all join together that things get interesting and trickier. And so there are all these different types of sweater constructions, yoke sweaters, raglan sweaters, drop shoulder, modified drop shoulder, set in sleeve. There are all these different type, uh, sleeve, top of the sleeve, and uh, shaping that can go on in this upper body, this bodice area of the sweater. And that's the most complicated and kind of interesting part of the sweater. And so that is why I knit this sweater because it was so unusual. So I knit the, the body, it's very long because that was the style in the 1890s. So I knit the body and then, and then once I got that done and I got the interesting part done, I got it figured out. Then what was left was the sleeves not very interesting. And this whole sweater is knit one, pearl one. So I knew that um, I'm the information seeker, process knitter. I got what I wanted out of the sweater. And, but I also want this product. So this 1890s sweater is one piece of a larger project that I'm working on where I wanted to knit my way through the 20th century decade by decade, one sweater at a time. And so originally I had no intention of doing the 1890s, but it, the more I researched it, the more I realized how interesting the, even though the sweaters look very basic, the construction methods were very different and diverse from each other. Like the, it just seemed like there was a lot of experimentation going on. So I thought it was worth you know, going back one decade to do that. But it also means that I really do want the finished product, even if I don't ever really wear it for anything, because I want it as part of the piece of the entirety um, and to show how construction methods have changed and styles have changed and, and all of that. I'm just down at the bottom of the sleeve. I'm just started, I switched to uh, a smaller needle to, uh, to do the cuff, so that will get finished uh, today. And then I have to do the other sleeve after that. So this is a very boring knit. It's something that I needed this week. It's been kind of a stressful week. So I needed something where I didn't have to think too much. And Knit One Pro One ribbing was nice and boring uh, for that. So I'll be finishing this, I'm, I'm sure, sometime in possibly by next week. Um, then I have some ends to weave in and wash and block and all that kind of thing. And hopefully I... Uh, can at least try it on for you guys. So I'll be happy to get this one off my plate. But again, I don't want to start anything new until this thing is done. So this is a sweater. I bought the yarn from, it, this is a dark, this is a natural color. I don't know if you can even see the ribbing pattern on here, uh, or not the ribbing pattern, the cable pattern. 
I followed this shepherd on Twitter called uh, Zwart Bless Ireland. So Zwart Bless means black with a blaze. Uh, it's a type of black sheep with a white blaze, white tip on the tail, and at least two of the feet have little white socks on them. It could be all four, it could be three or four two, three or four of the feet can have white. And so she's in Kilkenny, Ireland. And I came across her around the time when I was interested in learning to knit, exploring other wool breeds. And so I bought this yarn from her as a birthday present to myself. And then I, later in the year, I designed the, the sweater. And one of the things that I noticed about it is like the yarn is sticky. And so usually with an Erin sweater, uh, I want a nice smooth yarn like a um, so that you get the um, cables will really pop. Well, this is such a dark yarn, so it's a little harder to see the cables, although if you're up close, you can see them just fine. It's just on camera, it's a little hard. But it is a little harder to read the knitting and see what's going on, but the yarn seemed kind of sticky and it was kind of, it was like, it's so weird that it's so sticky. And I found out that, that she has a, a mill near her in her county in Kilkenny. And she takes her wool there to be processed and turned into yarn. But she, they also um, weave her um, wool into blankets that she designed. And she sells those um, as well. And so I had been looking at some video about the mill and they use this kind of, um, a spinning machine called a spinning mule. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I really knew nothing about spinning at the time. I spent a lot of time avoiding learning anything about spinning. So then later in the spring, when I realized I needed to learn to spin uh, and doing so to understand wool more, uh, over time, I realized that this yarn is a woolen spun yarn. The spinning mule creates a woolen spun yarn. I thought, oh, I wonder if that's going to make, once it's washed, if the cables aren't going to pop as much. Like, I just didn't know. But it's it's a stickier wool. It's harder to work with than a worsted spun yarn. Not worsted weight, but worsted spun yarn would be, which is much smoother. I finished the back and I had started the front, just got through the ribbing and put it to, side, to the side one more time. And it's just been sitting here in my office. And I keep thinking, oh, I really need to get back to that sweater. I haven't done it. So in all of this yarn exploration I've been doing lately, in looking at these mills, these smaller mills that produce different types of yarns, I found that there was a yarn company in Montana called Beaver Slide. Uh, and they have their, uh, their wool processed in a mill in Ontario, Canada. So it's a day trip for them. So they drive it up to this mill. It's called Custom Woolen Mills, I think it is. And they have them um, spin their yarn and they have a spinning mule as well. And what they say on their website is that their yarn is Z-plied. And they thought, oh, you know, our customers have told us we should let people know that our yarn is Z-plied uh, because if you um, like to do twined knitting, um, that is the kind of yarn that is uh, needed for that or is best for that. And I thought, oh, interesting. Z-plied yarn. I, you know, I've been ordering yarn from Sweden that was Z-plied and trying to find it in different places. So I have ordered some from, from Beaver Slide. I haven't received it yet. In the meantime, I took a look at my Zwartbless yarn that was also mule spun and it is Z-plied as well. And that is what I'm wondering is if part of the whole combination of what has made this a trickier sweater to knit than I usually experience is that it's a stickier yarn because it's woolen. It's very dark yarn, so it's harder to read my stitches. And I'm wondering if the Z-ply somehow just feels different in my hands. So I'm waiting to get um, some more yarns and do some more experiments with these Z-plied yarns to see um, what that, what effect that that has um, on my knitting. So once I finish my 1890s sweater, I will probably be back to work on this Erin sweater um, because I am more interested now in in the reasons why I have felt like this was a trickier cable knit than I'm used to. And just to understand how the, 
the wool impacts um, these impacts the project in different ways based on the color, the way it's spun, and the way it's plied. Uh, it's still a beautiful sweater. It's just a little bit more challenging for me to knit. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.